Successful Modernizations. I'm the Senior Project Manager for this project. Welcome for the, to this community design workshop today. We just want to let you know, sorry, just want to let you know that this is being live streamed today. So there's a camera over here on the side, just so you know that that's happening with a hot mic over here and Johnny's managing that for us. Thank you very much, Johnny. Uh, from our team today, we also have Eric Gerding. You've been to these meetings before. You've probably met Eric. And we also have Darren Lee from OSM. David Main is back there on also from OSM as a communications manager. Hector Lopez is in the back, also on this project. And thanks to Derek, who I think is out looking at the door, making sure people can get in, that he helped us with all the food today and setting up this meeting. So thanks to the whole team. Um, also want to say, just in case anybody needs a restroom, there are men's and women's restrooms to the left, and uh, there's an all-user restroom if you cannot go to the right. And with that, I will hand it off to Bora, the architects, and they will introduce themselves. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's a great turnout on a sunny Saturday to Saturday. Um, so thank you for being here and in the library today. Um, I'm Steffi Knudsen. I am the principal in charge of a project at Bora. I am also a graduate of uh, this building from 1988, married to a graduate from 1985. Um, so I have a love-hate relationship probably with this existing building, but a love-love relationship with this place. Um, I am here with uh, my uh, business partner, Amy Donahue, who is the design principal, with Amelie Reynaud, who's our lead designer, with Aisha Marco, who is taking pictures in the back, and with Corey Squire, our director of sustainability. And then on our team is Maria Medina, who you'll see in the back, who's with After Bruce, and they have been coordinating our community engagement. We'd love to hear who's in the room today. So if you're a parent, could you please raise your hand? Ooh, lots of parents here. Oh, and uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the back if you can make sure you sign in. Um, if you're a student here, could you raise your hand? Hey. If you're, well, if you're a former student here, if you're an alumna or alumnus, Welcome. Um, what if you're a staff member? Welcome. Uh, neighbor? Lots of neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe neighbors and parents, right? Uh, a friend of uh, Ida B. Wells or a friend of... Or a friend of someone who goes to Ida B. Wells or a friend of... Okay, we're going to get to innocent bystanders in a minute. If you're a CPC member, uh -huh. okay, this one's not working. Hi, Don. Any other CPC members here? Hi, good to see you again. And then an uh, innocent bystander who happened to walk in off the street and is here just for the fun of it. I know there's a few, okay. From the business community. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, well I would count that as a neighbor. Okay, our mics are not working well today. Can I also ask the, the neighbors and the business manager or the community to make sure that you sign in, give us your email address. So if you're a parent or a student, we probably have captured your email. But if you're from outside, we may not have that. So we'll be able to keep you in the loop for future meetings. And, yeah. Thank you. All right, well, we'll just do what I can, and I can have a loud voice if need be, but I will try this very quickly. All right, this is what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to give you a bit of an overview of this process. For any of you who are here for the first time, uh, we're going to talk about what our objectives are, both in terms of this process as well as our objectives today. Um, we're going to do a bit of a look ahead for what's coming next. Um, we're going to review a little bit of what we've heard um, in previous sessions because not everyone's been here for every session. And we also want to make sure that we are reflecting what we've been hearing. Uh, Corey is going to walk us through a bit of a primer on carbon, what it is, why we care about it, and why it impacts our work as uh, architects and for this process. 
And then we're going to start walking through uh, design options that have grown out of all of that previous work. And then we're going to ask all of you to start to give us feedback. And if any of you have been here for our previous sessions, you'll recognize that this is what we've been doing kind of uh, over and over again. Um, we will have, can you can you hear the mic? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We will also uh, save a little bit of time at the end for public comment because this is a live stream and public meeting. Um, and then uh, we'll talk through some next steps. Um, in the past, we've had, uh, we've talked through a vision statement and guiding principles. Um, those are available on the website. We want to save a little bit of time today. We're not reviewing them today. But if you do go to the website, the Ida B. Wells Bond website, they're posted. And we would love for you to send us comments. We'll have the email address at the end. We are all working towards moving towards a single recommended option that we can uh, present to the board. But our work here today is not to choose an option, but rather to help us understand what you think is successful or not successful uh, about the options you'll see. Because our job is to try and synthesize that and try to come up with what the hybrids might be that takes the best of everything. Um, a modernization, which is what this project is, is actually about reconsidering physical space of a school and what uh, the school needs to provide in order for the things that need to happen inside to happen. But we do not work on curriculum and we don't work on how the school is managed. Um, as much as uh, I'm sure that there's a lot, there might be a lot of comments about how the school works, um, that's just not what we're here today to talk about, but we need to make sure that we're thinking towards the future. So we're not only thinking about the physical space that can work for what we know and what we understand today that will happen inside, but we need to plan for flexibility so that it can continue to adapt. When I think about what school was like 40 years ago when I was in this building, teaching and learning has really changed. We want to make sure that teaching and learning can continue to change as science learns more about the brain and all that good stuff. And so our job is to be able to take the public investment of these schools and make them last. Your job is to help us understand what will make it special and what will, uh, how do we make sure that the look and feel of this place is reflective of the kind of culture that is unique to this school um, that might be different than other schools. Um, I will note for any of you who might be here for the first time that we will be designing this school with the common education specification that all the modernizations have had. You can think of that like it's a recipe book. All of the modernizations have designed for the same kind of cake, but there's also unique things about cake. But we have to fit within the same basic pan, maybe um, have common elements to them, but there also might be a few unique elements about this school. Um, this school will be designed for a, a target uh, enrollment of 1,700 students, but that also will allow it to flex up and down by a couple of hundred students. And that's how we try and design for today and design for the future and really try and give flexibility. So if you end up having any questions about that, uh, you can see me or one of our OSM, Office of School Modernization teammates, um, later. Okay, where are we now? Um, this is, uh, for those of you who like graphs of schedules like me, because I'm kind of a project management nerd, uh, this is the whole process that we started in October and is working towards a board meeting on April 2nd. And as you can see, we are here in the process. We are at this community design workshop, which previously was here, but thanks to the ice storm, and thank you all for being here on a rescheduled time. Um, we are working, we're kind of in our last phases of reconsidering uh, options and trying to design options to work towards a recommendation for a, a scheme and a recommended budget for that board meeting. Um, in the bigger picture, this process is really early on in the process of creating and modernizing a school. So you can think of it as we're just setting some of the big parameters for this project right now. Um, then we'll start the design process, which uh, starts kind of loose and gradually adds detail 
That design process takes somewhere between 18 and 24 months. And then we put together a set of documents, sometimes called construction documents, sometimes called contract documents. You guys don't care. Those are the kinds of documents that describe to whoever's going to construct and build the project what all of the pieces that are going to go into the project. It also is what is approved for permit. And then we start, oops, hit the wrong button. Then we start construction, and construction is two to three years long. So that gives you kind of an idea of where this is in the whole process. So what we've heard so far. Um, we have had, this is our third community design workshop. And then we also have a comprehensive planning committee that has met. And those have met, uh, the comprehensive plan planning committee has met four times. Um, and so we've been compiling uh, in the feedback and the comments from those, those are all available on the PPS bond website. Um, in our previous comprehensive planning committee meetings, we had brought three schemes um, and each of those schemes had some successes and challenges uh, with them. Two of the schemes had kept the track in the same place. One scheme moved the track and reoriented it to have a north-south orientation, which we understand is better for the um, football and soccer sports that happen on the field because it has, uh, no one's looking in the sun for half the game. Um, but uh, in this third one, we also looked at what would happen if we re relocated the pool. And um, very strong feedback from the community that we'll talk about for um, being concerned about relocating the pool. We also should note, that the pool is not owned by or operated by Portland Public Schools, and it isn't really their decision necessarily um, to relocate the pool. It's a multi-agency issue. So you will see in our schemes today, all of them will show the pool in its current location, but we're also trying to design schemes that are uh, pool-proof or pool-agnostic um, in the future. If the pool is no longer there, we can consider what might happen, but in none of them are we looking at relocating them to another area of the state. Um, and uh, I, anything else I'm missing, Amelie, that's important to point out? So this is the feedback we received. From you. This is all the feedback that we've been receiving from our previous comments. So um, among the things that we did in our last community design workshop and in our last uh, CPC, Comprehensive Planning Committee, we put together a, a survey, kind of an either or survey. Um, and we asked a number of questions. We, we thought it would be really interesting to show um, some of the results. Um, in particular, one of the questions we asked was uh, uh, about keeping a strongly advocate for keeping the public pool, um, which is this blue color, or strongly advocate for optimizing the campus and reconsidering if the pool is there or not. That is this dark salmon color. And you can see that from the community feedback, there was a very strong response for keeping the pool and moderate response, three quarters, and the, the very strong response for modern, uh, considering the campus without the pool and optimizing the campus uh, totaled about a quarter with, with a 11% strong. And you can see that the response from those on the CPC was actually almost the reverse or not quite the reverse, much stronger um, advocate for reconsidering the campus, some strong advocacy for keeping the pool as is. So it's just very interesting to think about the um, uh, diversity of opinions in the communities. Another question we asked had to do with the track and field. This has to do with reorienting the track or field or not. But it also, we have to understand if we reorient the track and field, there will be disruption, more disruption during construction. And similarly, this the strong is for optimizing the campus, reorienting the track and field. The salmon was for keeping the track and field where it is in order to not have that disruption. So you can see from the community, it was almost evenly split on both those sides, including with the strong responses. From the CPC, there was a much stronger response to optimizing the campus and potentially reorienting the field. And then the last question that um, had some very, you know, quite uh, quite strong answers in some ways um, had to do with where's the front door and where's the entry. And we're going to talk a lot about that today as well. Um, 
The community had a strong response for Capitol Highway being uh, the entry and a relatively small response for it being on Vermont, but overall close to half and half. The CPC had a much stronger response for there being overall orienting towards Capitol Highway, but a much smaller, strong response um, uh, for orienting it towards Capitol Highway. So those are just a couple of kind of interesting things that we can keep in mind. And when we walk through the comments today, one thing we did hear was just a very strong response for access from Capitol Highway and from the Hillsdale business community for students and visitors alike. So we've been really working on um, understanding that strength. From here, we're gonna walk through a bit of a primer on carbon with Chloe. All right. You can hear some clicker. Okay. Hey everyone, can you hear me all right? My name is Corey Squire. I am sustainability director at Fora and the sustainability lead on this project. Um, one of our primary considerations is the PPS climate action um, and response plan, which um, which the board passed maybe a year ago. Um, and the, the current schools that are being monitored right now are the first collection of schools that are going to adhere to this new plan. So part of this process is kind of digging into it, understanding what that means for the project. Um, but at a high level, what I wanted to do today was just talk about kind of the question of carbon. So specifically carbon, carbon emissions, and its impact on the design, which is how we're considering for this project. So here's a primer, which is the carbon cycle, right? And most people are familiar with this. Um, there's carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that is absorbed by plants and becomes kind of biomass. Animals eat those plants and become part of the biomass of animals. Eventually animals and plants decay and the CO2 goes back. Um, and that's, that's how the system has worked. And it's kept a pretty consistent amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over the past hundreds of thousands of years. And that's been about 350 parts per million. Um, now, more recently, since the Industrial uh, Revolution, we've had an additional source, right? At, at some point, millions of years ago, some plants and animals decayed, were buried on the ground. Over time, um, kind of these decayed plants and animals became fossil fuels. And today, we're mining those and burning that to power our buildings, to power our transportation systems, to power our industry. And that CO2 is re entering uh, the carbon cycle, right? And now we're at about 421 parts per million. Um, what does that mean? Um, locally, that means that we're experiencing some extreme weather. So this is an image from the heat wave that we had in 21, near the temperature spike to 115 degrees for, for three days. Um, it's also impacting uh, wildfire events and smoke, um, which is a big impact in the summer falls in our region, um, with the expectation that that will continue and hopefully worsen. So um, we often think about carbon emissions kind of being the responsibility of the transportation system. We drive and we see uh, kind of exhaust come out of tailpipes. Um, but actually, the number one source of carbon emissions globally are, are building. Um, and that's why it's so important that we're thinking about carbon while we're designing and constructing this building. So for those reasons mentioned earlier, um, kind of we know the carbon atmosphere is bad. We know this warming of climate is causing these negative impacts um, on, on people in, in our community and around around the, the world. But how bad is carbon, right? There's actually a social cost. And this was established by the EPA, um, peer review, a lot of research. Uh, but basically, every ton of carbon that gets released into the atmosphere costs society about $190. Um, and how is this cost paid, right? If um, it's, it's paid at increased medical expenses, maybe due to negative health impacts of smoke inhalation, right? Or extreme weather adaptation, right? If people are in the past didn't have air conditioning in their homes and now they need to buy air conditioning, that's a cost uh, to society, right? Crop failures, extreme weather, um, ice storm, those kind of things. So we want to consider this number and we want to decrease the carbon emissions associated with our work as much as possible, but we can actually calculate the impact that our design has kind of on the global um, here and on the climate. So when we're thinking about carbon emissions associated with buildings, where do they come from? Specifically, they come from choices around window systems, around HVAC and comfort systems, air conditioning, heating, um, structural systems. Um, a lot of 
Energy and carbon goes into manufacturing structural systems, other building systems, land use, transportation. Um, all these are going to come into play. So uh, buildings have a relationship with carbon where they kind of release carbon emissions in the atmosphere for in one of two ways, right? One is operational carbon. This is we burn fossil fuel to generate electricity that powers lights, powers air conditioning, air powers other building systems. And they also embody carbon. And this is when we burn fossil fuels to mine, to manufacture, to transport um, building material, and then we construct a building with those. So embodied carbon is a one-time expense to do on the project. And operational carbon is kind of an ongoing expense year after year. The way that we address, we address each of these in different ways. The way we address operational carbon is with energy efficiency. That's what we're all familiar with. Also solar PVs, the project will have solar PVs. The way that we address operational carbon is by really um, kind of focusing in on the materials that we're using for the project. Um, we want to use more wood because wood sequesters carbon from the atmosphere as it grows and we can store that in buildings. We want to use less concrete and steel, which are very heavy, carbon intensive, energy intensive buildings. Now, between those two considerations, operational carbon and body carbon, um, one of them is more important than the other, right? So this is a picture of the Bonneville Dam which generates a significant amount of the energy that we use in the city of Portland um, in a clean and carbon-free way. Uh, it turns out that compared to other parts of the country, our electrical grid is very, very clean. Uh, much less carbon is generated our schools, businesses here in Portland than other parts. So here's kind of an idealized graphic showing how much embodied carbon this building would generate. As a typical building, it hasn't been designed yet, but as a typical benchmark building, and how much embodied energy, embodied carbon would be um, generated over the next um, 25, 27 years through 2030, 2050. Um, oh, there was a line change if you see um, So this is a benchmark building. Um, the assumption is it's probably going to be steel. So this is this is a simulation for steel. Yes, yeah, it would be much less. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, Way to skip to the punchline. Yeah, you? very ahead of us. <laughs> Uh, but I want to point out before before that good point is that also the state of Oregon by law is supposed to decarbonize the electrical grid by 2040, which is why every year the electricity uses less and less carbon. And by 2040, there's no additional carbon being generated or emitted in the atmosphere um, through operations of the building. So it turns out that about 80% of the carbon associated with this building for the first 30 years or even beyond of its useful life is going to be the embodied building. Right, and that goes back to just more wood, less concrete, less steel. So one way of doing that is wood structure. We'll look for a lot of opportunities for swapping out um, parts of the structural system or other building systems um, with wood or other natural bio-based materials. Um, and then just getting into a little bit of metric around this climate, uh, the TPS climate action plan, um, the goal is to reduce carbon Sorry, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030, right? So that is six years away. And, and that's based on the 2018, 2019 school year of the baseline. And then by 2040, we're supposed to be kind of zero carbon free school. Um, and this building being a major kind of investment in cost and energy and funds, um, kind of coming up to that deadline, along with the other modernization projects, are kind of key part of this goal. So, but what we what we decide to do on this project, the decision we make around the sign, um, directly impact whether or not the school district meets these goals or not. So I'm not going to walk through all of the goals, but um, they are listed on on the board. There will be a board. There will be a board. Those boards are going to flip around. There'll be information on them, <laughs> um, and you can dig into a little bit more detail around specifically what the climate action plan asks of us from this perspective of carbon and energy. Uh, but basically, there are three pillars of the climate action plan. The pillars are broken down the goals. The goals are broken down to a series of commitments. Pillar one, reduce environmental impact and costs. And then goal 1.1, the TPS will design and construct new low carbon schools and renovations that are energy efficient, resilient, and adaptable to our new climate. And there's seven specific kind of commitments under, under that goal and those are listed on the board. That's all I had today. So it's a primer on carbon just to start thinking about it. I have time for one or two questions. Yeah. Um, are you considering CLT? Sorry, one question. We are considering CLT. That would be a, a great strategy from the perspective of significantly lowering that embodied carbon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
CLT. Sorry, CLT is a is a wood structural. Cross laminated timber. No questions, but I will be standing by the board when we kind of walk around. If you have more questions about carbon or the policy, um, please come see me then. Sorry, this is one of those topics that I know we could spend hours on. So that's why we brought a board. If you do have questions, we want to hear them. We want to give you good answers. They could be very technical. They could be very high level. And Corey will be available after to help answer those questions. But that's why I was like, it's no questions yet. So we want to make sure we get through all of these topics and give everyone a chance. So thanks. that's a good and point. Then, and we can go as deep as you all want to when we um, in later conversations. And then next time, uh, we know that there's been a lot of questions about indoor air quality. We will have a similar primer uh, about indoor air quality um, when we do a open house later in March. Um, and that'll also be a time when we'll be reporting out a bit more of uh, where, we're, where we're looking. Now, Amelie will walk through the site. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Amelie. I will be um, introducing two site teams that we brought today. Um, these three diagrams may look familiar to you. We did an exercise with you all last two times ago um, regarding Ida B. Wells as a person and her legacy and how um, her inspiration with her and her legacy and her work can inspire the architecture and the form of the project. So we have two themes today that we're going to talk about, but we wanted to keep this here because we're still thinking about these big ideas and inspired by her legacy and how they can start to inform our work. Um, before we dig into the individual schemes, we wanted to kind of take a step back and look at the whole site uh, as a whole and really start to understand some of the constraints and some of the drivers uh, that, are, that we're working with that are informing um, where we're putting the building and how we're circulating around it. Um, so this is a, a kind of a map here of the existing site showing some of the major players. Um, the fields over in the, on the Riki side of the site are staying as is. Um, the softball field will be improved. So we're really going to focus on what's on the Ida B. Wells campus right now. Um, the dashed red line are designated uh, Southwest Trail routes, in case you were not aware. So as part of the scope of this project, those trails will be improved. And so we're really thinking about how those trails, how they're used currently, but also how we can really integrate them and think about them as we're um, designing the circulation around the site. Um, the track and field is a really big one, uh, literally and uh, metaphorically. Uh, we're looking at an option today that rotates the track and field as well as an option that will keep it where it is. Um, the pool, as Steffi mentioned, is uh, for our options that we're introducing today, staying in its current location but we're really trying to make these schemes uh, pool proof, as she said, meaning um, they aren't really um, uh, right up against the pool. They're not, um, they don't feel like they are a result of the pool location necessarily, but they really could work with or without the pool in place. And then the other really big driving factor is the existing school footprint. So we know that uh, the Ida Wells campus, this building will be operational during construction. And you see the dashed outline on this map here. That is a large constraint in terms of where we can actually put the building um, and where we can put the field. So um, this is a diagram of uh, kind of the driving forces behind scheme one that we'll introduce today. It keeps the track and field in the same position. The pool is obviously where it is. Um, and then we are relocating the baseball field to the east part of the site on top of basically right here. Um, and then the multi-use field, which would be a, a new and improved multi-use field will be to the west of the building. And then there would be parking on the northeast and the southeast. Now, how do you circulate? How do you think about uh, pedestrian approach to this building location? What we're really thinking with this option is that with that Southwest Trails route sort of uh, headed east-west along the northern end of the site, there really could be a great pedestrian, a very strong north-south pedestrian connection uh, running on the east side of the building that intersects with that trail. And so that arrival point to your campus might feel as if it's this intersection between the Southwest Trail running uh, east-west on the north and this really strong pedestrian connection uh, running north-south that leads you right to a central entrance on the east side of the building. For this is back to the site diagram. For our second option that we're showing today, we are relocating the track and field. We're putting the baseball field and the multi-use field on the eastern part of the site. Uh, we have a slight modification of this that we'll, we'll introduce in the more detailed scheme. 
Um, but then there would be parking on the southeast corner and parking just to the north of the building. And you can kind of see the funny shape of the buildable area around the pool. That is technically where we could build, where we could build, but we really put thought into what is the best building form um, in this approximate position. And with this particular scheme, we are going to share a building shape or building form that's slightly more compact and a little bit taller. Um, scheme one is about three stories tall, and scheme two is actually four stories, which um, opens up a little bit more flexibility for site component. So circulation to this uh, to this buildable area um, is a little bit more direct, as you can see from Capitol Highway. So by rotating the track and field, it actually allows pedestrians to circulate to the west side of the building a little bit sooner and arrive at a central entry point um, slightly more direct and more visibly um, welcoming from the Capitol Highway approach. This is a detailed view of scheme two, or excuse me, scheme one, and I will say that these are on the posters that are around the room. So at the end of this um, presentation, we can take a few questions and then we're gonna flip all the posters around and really um, ask you to look at them in a lot of detail and provide some feedback. Um, but these are the high, high level um, attributes. Um, so as I mentioned in the diagram, the main entry to this uh, to scheme one is right here on the east side with this really strong north-south pedestrian connection that intersects with the trail on the north end, directly adjacent to the Capitol Highway approach. Um, there will be new tennis courts that are relocated to the southeast corner of the site, um, a new baseball field on the northeast corner of the site, parking just north of that. Um, the existing pool is still in its current location. Um, for each of these schemes, we are um, thinking about the entry to the pool along the east edge, and there would be a new support building to support the pool, because as you know, a lot of the um, support services for the pool are in this building currently. So we're going to have to provide some sort of a support building exact details of that TDD, but that could be sort of an entry point into the pool in the future. Um, the existing track and field would uh, remain in the same place with improvements. Uh, a new multi-use field to the west of the building, and then um, the building form, which I can kind of dive into in more detail on the next slide, um, really starts to embrace the topography change. So the, the changing in the uh, elevation on the earth on the southwest corner of the site, as you all know, there's some burns, it starts to step down. So this building is a little bit more stretched out in the east-west direction, and it takes advantage of that topography change and um, sort of reflects the, the grading of the site step down. Uh, real quickly, we wanted to provide a few um, dimensions, just talking about entry. So the entry right now from the approximate um, Northwest campus approach right at that intersection by uh, the food carts is about 894 feet to the northern entrance of this building. Um, with this scheme, the distance from that same point to the east so the main entrance on the east would be about 1,200 feet. So a little bit longer, um, arguably more direct because we'll be walking along a very uh, beautifully upgraded trail and um, parking will be way better configured and, and all of that. But we wanted to talk about these dimensions for comparison. This is a section, a uh, cross section through the entire site. This is the existing section on the northern, uh, the northern uh, <laughs> top part of the page here. And then on the bottom, this is the section of the proposed uh, building mapping, the building form in scene one. Um, you can see that it starts to step down the terrain as it moves to the west. And this is a zoomed in version of this building a form idea. Um, back to kind of Steffi's diagram about the face. We are still in that very, very preliminary uh, phase of design. So this is not yet an articulated building design, but it's the way we're thinking about the different major um, uh, interior spaces and how they might lay out on the site. And so really uh, the, the basic configuration is that there would be a very strong central commons space, uh, which is where the, the dining happens and um, lots, of, lots of different activities. And then the main entry would be directly associated with that commons. And then on the, the north side would be uh, the uh, athletics and CE, uh, as well as admin and counseling and other support spaces. And then on the south side, there would be the auditorium and performing arts and those supporting spaces. This is because we're stepping down in topography here, the main entry would actually be a level higher than um, this courtyard shown on the west here. And so you can see there's opportunity for opening up 
uh, double height spaces on the interior and really kind of embracing the, um, the, the grade as it starts to step down and seeing that on the interior of the building as well. And we'll be studying where things go for months and months and months and months. And so this is just an, another idea of potentially flipping where the athletics was, making it a little bit further east and maybe putting the performing arts on the southwest corner. But those are the, the big rocks that we're kind of starting to look at in the interior of the space. This is a 3D massing view of that this non-architecture architecture. architecture. Um, so a couple of highlights. Um, I mentioned the building form kind of stepping up with the natural grade of the site. Um, in this particular case, we're proposing that the gym and athletics will be closer to the track and field and the multi-use field. Um, the primary bars, we, we call them, you know, for these, these bars, for lack of a better word, lack of a better word, that are running east-west, um, would contain the classrooms. And the classrooms would be in the upper levels, um, which is optimal for solar orientation um, facing primarily north and south. For those of you who might remember Corey's primer last time, we talked a lot about solar orientation. So this is really optimal for instructional spaces in terms of the solar. Um, the main entry connects to the central columns, and uh, the auditorium in this particular configuration is close to the main entry. Team two. Um, all right. So backing up. This is our second option. This is the option that rotates the track and field. I mentioned that this is a slightly more compact building. So we are actually about four stories. The last one is three and two and kind of step down the, the terrain. Um, this is a, a much a much a taller building, but you'll see in some more 3D mapping views that we have coming up, it doesn't really feel so much bigger um, when it's all said and done, but it is more centrally located in the middle of the site. Um, it has a really great connection from Capitol Highway. Um, our landscape architects put a little, uh, a little bit of, a little bit more thought into this scheme in terms of how you arrive from Capitol Highway as if you're a pedestrian, um, or if you're a car. And there's a large parking lot to the north of the building with a drop off that would serve uh, the track and field, other field, pool, um, as well as this really strong north-south pedestrian connection, which now is occurring on the west side of the building. Um, this pedestrian connection leads you right to a front central entrance that would be uh, off of Vermont Street. Um, this entry is also really easily accessible from the southeast. There's a large parking lot on the southeast in this scheme as well. Um, new tennis courts also in the southeast part of the site, but also but a little bit further north, a little bit further away from Burlingame. Uh, new baseball field and multi-use field. One thing to note with this option, could be a possibility with the other option as well is that we're overlapping the multi-use field oh, and the baseball field um, in a way that is um, recommended by our uh, sports field consultant so that we're not um, limiting the use of either field, but the outfield is in the, of the baseball field in this particular option is overlapping with the multi-use field. Those could be pulled apart, but you see that it affords you a few other things on the site that you don't have the previous issue. Um, keep the existing pool with the new school support build, building and access to that is uh, very similar to the previous option. Um, the direct invisible pedestrian approach from Capitol Highway, new track and field with an optimal north-south orientation. Um, this building form has a central commons as well that opens onto a, um, an outdoor terrace along the terrace along the west side of the building. Um, the commons in that terrace would have views over the track and field, uh, which is at a slightly lower elevation. And we'll look at a section in a moment. So that's a this is a really great view to the west opportunity. Um, and then the north-south pedestrian path connecting the parking, the track and field, and school entry plaza. Cleaner view of that. And then the distances from Capitol Highway approach. Um, so we know that the distance, we already talked about 894 feet approximately to the um, north entrance of this building right now from Capitol Highway. This one would be in that same ballpark. So uh, slightly more direct, you're not having to go through the parking lot. You um, kind of enter into that uh, pedestrian plaza as soon as you come off the Capitol Highway approach, and then you um, connect to that north-south uh, pedestrian connection that leads you directly to a central entrance off of Vermont. And this is a section of the building. And you can see the track and field is a little bit lower. And so there would be really great opportunities for views along the pedestrian path, as well as from the commons and somewhat in the building. And this is a uh, very rough 
configuration of the major elements of the interior. Uh, we are showing the auditorium and performing arts um, just to the east of the main entrance off of Vermont. And in this scheme, the main gym and the auxiliary and all the athletics and support would be kind of along this northwest bar, uh, which would be really uh, accessible from the parking lot to the bar. This is a view of this idea. Again, we're talking about instructional spaces being on the east-west bars with really great um, solar orientation. Um, the building form in this scheme um, really is kind of uh, making gestures and connecting to both entrances in a way, which we weren't able to do with the other scenes um, due to the, the uh, track and field placement. Um, like I said, the gym and athletics is really close to the Capitol Highway approach. Um, classrooms are on the upper levels. And that's it. So we wanted to pass through some really conceptual massing views of what this building might be like from the street. And this is not the architecture, but it's about the size and the scale. Um, so this is scheme one. The, the scheme one is the one with the track and field in its current location. So this is a view of scheme one from the street, from Vermont Street, from the southeast corner of Vermont Street. So, so looking at the building, scheme one, and that's scheme two. Back to scheme one. This is the Capitol Highway view. So as you're coming in, this is the um, ballet school to the to the on the right of the page here. So this is team one with the track and field of, in its current configuration um, as you normally see with the grandstand. And this is a view of scheme two with the track and field rotated. Still a little bit of view of the track and field, but you can see the pedestrian plaza brings you right in. And this is the view of scheme one from the southwest um, corner of the site. So on Vermont Street in the southwest this time, looking at scheme two, excuse me, scheme one. And this is the view of scheme two, the four story building with the entrance off of Vermont. And this is a summary um, of the two. And you can kind of see them side by side. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of similar things in terms of the building form, but. Um, the movement of the track and field really starts to set up some, some different um, opportunities and constraints. And there are some trade-offs to consider that I'll let Steffi talk through. So our big goal here is to make uh, two really great schemes and um, make it really hard for anyone to say, I like this one or that one better. But there are some differences and some trade-offs, and this will get to, uh, eventually, we'll have to start to make some decisions. So a couple of things to consider. Obviously, uh, Scheme 2 has a lot more uh, site work disruption by moving the track and field. That has some schedule implication because the track and field will uh, be disrupted for the entire uh, duration of construction and probably um, uh, the duration of that will go a little bit longer um, as a result. Um, for that reason, um, scheme one has some, uh, may, might have some lower building costs. You know, we, they, they're pretty similar. And when we put that on there, we actually have a slightly different building scheme. They might be closer now, but the site costs will obviously be lower for scheme one and the overall construction duration will be slightly lower for scheme one. Um, and that's a real thing. Um, even though they might be very close in overall costs, even a 1% difference in cost is, you know, millions of dollars, a couple million dollars. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the better connection to Capitol Highway. That's some feedback we've heard from all of you. And this one will have a bit of a better connection to Capitol Highway and improved future track and field operations. But... Um, this one will have no disruption in the track and field operations during construction. So that's a trade-off. Um, also, this one, um, as we've been uh, designing it, actually does have the potential to provide uh, a roadway of some sort that can go all the way from the north to the south. Um, we haven't been able to find a good way to do that yet on Scheme 2. doesn't mean it can't happen. But that's not what we're doing right now. And it looks like it could be pretty challenging to do that. So that we think is also a trade off. And then for some of you, this may not be a big deal, but for everyone who's going to be working in and um, operating the building, 
Um, scheme one uh, is providing kind of a loading area that is relatively small. Um, scheme two um, had a little bit more options for loading um, and a little bit maybe better and flexible loading area. So we just wanted to plant a little bit for all of you to consider what we see as some of the trade-offs that might uh, make us start to lean uh, one or the other. We will have a board uh, when we turn those around in just a minute. Um, and we're really interested in um, how you all feel about those trade-offs, um, which trade-offs maybe are a higher priority for you um, or that you think should be a higher priority for the modernization. So from here, we're gonna be doing this feedback exercise and uh, we're gonna, and Amelie and Aisha, and you're all welcome to help turn over these boards. We can also move the tables away. Um, and hold on one sec. Um, what we'd like you to do is to spend a few minutes thinking um, and self-reflecting on your observations. What are some of the trade-offs you've been uh, thinking about? Um, what are your initial impressions about what you think might be successful or challenging about some of the different options? The reason we're asking you to self-reflect for a minute is to try and avoid too much influence um, of, of the mass, right? If you see everybody having the same comment. Uh, but then we really want everyone to walk about and to um, put post-it notes from these self-reflections onto the boards. Um, you'll see there are spaces over there for successes and challenges. Um, there's the trade-off board way over there, um, similar in the back. Um, and we'd love for you to put your post-it notes on, but also uh, it's a time to ask questions or to talk with each other and, and see um, what starts to emerge. Yeah. Uh, please note that if you think of something later or you just don't want to put it on a post-it note or you just want to send some feedback, um, there is a PPS bond um, email address to send that to. And believe me, we've been receiving those additional comments and we really appreciate them. So we're gonna work on this for about 40 minutes. I think these times weren't updated um, from when we've added some public comment at the end. Um, before you all self-reflect, um, questions? Felt it out. Um, what's in the full support building? The question is about what is uh, foreseen to be in the full support building. Currently, um, all of the mechanical systems have already been moved out of the existing Ida B. Wells building and they're all independent. So right now, the uh, current building physical space that Ida B. Wells is su uh, supporting it with is the changing rooms. Um, we'll need to at least replace that, but this is something where we'll need to actually sit down with Portland Parks and um, you know determine how much and what they will need for that full support building once we're removing the physical building. We're also reorienting where the entrance to the pool might wanna be. And so uh, we'll need to talk with PTR about what kinds of needs they'll have for that. So it's a little bit TV. This time, uh, it's really good question. You've got a nice red line on all of these too, which is kind of from an article. Oh, like red line is problematic. <laughs> uh, the securable perimeter. Yeah. Is that an eight foot chain link fence like at McDaniel, or is that like a four foot, you know, wrought iron fence like at Lincoln? Uh, I believe I might need Donna, you to chime in on which ones are the eight foot or six foot actually fences and which are the four feet. But uh, it's really important right now. This campus is wide open, which, as we all know, is is not a very secure campus for the students and the staff that are here. So we do want to be able to secure the perimeter. That said, we also want to provide the opportunity for them for the perimeter to be open and to allow the community to walk through the site, especially when school is not in session and in some areas when school is in session. Donna, do you want to add anything? I just say the type of fence has not been determined at all. We haven't gotten to that level of design, but it would probably be a six foot fence for security. The district standard is six foot fence where we have security. And I think it's four foot fence when we're just trying to crowd control, crowd control or, um, you know, help people uh, find the right access way. Next question. Oh, there's a couple over here. Go ahead. Um, just out of curiosity, so one of the selling options of scheme one, which means sports track and where it's at, would 
we're building a 30 to 50 year new affordable building here. What's the remaining life cycle on that track? You know, need to 50 years out of it stays there? You know, we're actually still doing an assessment of it. Um, the, our understanding right now is that the existing track is still built on the same um, construction as it was originally built in 1954. And um, the, that that's not the best practices now, the way they built them then. Um, but we're, we need to understand what the long-term life of the track is. So the surface was certainly replaced relatively recently. Um, so there's already been some investment there. So that we don't have a, a good answer for that yet. Um, we're hoping to have that. That's pretty point. critical. There's almost the tail lagging on you salvage that and then 10 years later, that's a core up. So. Sure. They've been talking about doing some major upgrades of the track and field at Jackson before this all would happen. So would that be, I mean, what is everybody like aware of that or is it actually happening? It could be an alternate location for it. Yes, the question is about potentially upgrading the uh, Jackson Middle School track and field. And yes, yes, that would be the plan to upgrade those fields so that we could use those during a construction. Okay. You'll you'll go. Why don't we go you, and uh, then you, and then Don, and then what's your name? Aaron. Aaron. I know we've seen each other a lot. I should know. Okay. Um, I just had some questions about like the safety features, I guess, within the school. And I, this is my first meeting, so I don't know if it's been covered, but um, we were curious about what's being done in terms of seismically reinforcing the building. And then also safety features in case of emergency, like if there's an active shooter or a fire or things like that, like what's being done? Yeah, so the question is about safety, both in terms of um, safety for earthquake seismic, as well as safety operationally in terms of potential um, active shooters or things like that. Um, so currently, all PPS buildings in new modernizations, if it's a reconstruction, um, are required to meet, this is going to be technical, so bear with me, um, something that's called risk category four. That's not necessarily an essential service, but it is um, a heightened level of, um, uh, it, should, it should allow for uh, the building to survive and operate past certain levels of earthquakes that are higher than normal. Most schools are required to meet uh, risk category three, and um, PPS is asking that all new construction meet risk category four. But we have PPS here. Thank you. All right. Um, in terms of internal safety, we're still very early on in the design, but uh, we have a lot of experience now making sure that we design the buildings as much as possible to be secured one entrance coming through the vestibule um, and really trying to employ as many of the best practices um, to improve the schools. You know, there's always this balance between trying to make sure the school feels good um, and feels welcoming and doesn't feel like it can be locked down at any moment and then allowing it also to feel safe and secure. Steffi, can we just repeat that it's risk category three and only category four in certain portions of yeah. some buildings? Just to, we just um, needed just to, to get that for, for that. people online, um, there was a correction that the building's designed for risk category three, which is a standard for schools. And there'll be some areas like the gym and some of the larger areas that'll be designed risk category four. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think uh, you are next. I just uh, I'm looking, but I keep teams and wonder whether uh, we need to go ball fields like softball and football fields. Um, other question is, um, I didn't see how um how close the home fields itself as baseball fields and um. Uh, so your first question, I think, had to do with potentially, was it overlapping baseball and softball? 
I don't understand why we don't. We do need some. Oh. And then I want yeah, the other uh, one. So the baseball and softball fields are very different. If we provide a baseball field, we have to provide a softball field. Um, and they they don't, they're not the same. So we have to have the two. Um, in terms of the pickleball, they're all, or first of all, pickleball, let's talk about that first. Pickleball is not in the ed spec. Education specification requires four tennis courts or optimally six. So you'll notice that we were not talking about pickleball and where we'll be providing four tennis courts. Um, and where it's noted pickleball on that, that's left over from a couple weeks ago before we had this conversation. We didn't reprint that because we were, we, we knew we'd tell you. Um, oops, we changed my turn. Um, and uh, the courts are all at least 50 feet away from the park. They are, then of course they will be useful. They might be used for pickleball. There's not. No. Um, pickleball, if I understand, is a half tennis court, so they could be used for pickleball, but that's not what we're um, specifically designing them for. That'll be an operational question. So I mm -hmm. submitted a comment a couple weeks ago, and uh, maybe you, you know, you didn't have a chance to discuss it, but just big issue for the clinic that we didn't talk about. That's going to be a lot longer than this. So many. You know, for the clinic. Um, and I would um, highly, uh, I, I actually asked you to find another place. So maybe someplace on the including entry field. You know, that's why I asked whether we need this uh, two cell phone uh, mm -hmm. fields. But this, this big overall issue is the point return for me and um and I hope that that will be a final. Do you want to? Not only that we did receive those comments and to please make them again. Yeah, we, we, will keep we did receive those comments. Feel free to submit them again, and that is one of the reasons why we are calling. You know, we're we're leaning into the ed spec, which has no pickleball, but we're going to design the infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I can't make any promises that in the future it might not be allowed. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Yes. That, that's there. Because if you design and you build it, then that's going to be a lot, a lot of help. But so that's, that has to be addressed in planning. Make sure you. I mentioned in my comments, the, um, this, uh, uh, this nation, please, please, to keep in mind. So that's 52 the property line, not to your property line. For the school. Thank you, Stephanie. I would really appreciate that. The number of parking spaces currently. Very important. Of the the bus, a lot of other people were buses before that, so you become more party tenders. I said they're picking up the dropping off for what people want to talk about. What a park and you don't know, like. So the question is about how many parking spaces there are now. I am sorry, but I don't know off the top of my head exactly how many there are now. I will say that the number of the parking spaces that are there now are not up to current code, and we couldn't fit that many on in the current configuration in the future. You will see that we're not putting the number of spaces yet on these schemes because we're still working on how, how can we massage it. We do understand how challenging it is to not drive to this school um and but we are also trying to make it as uh easy as possible for anyone who is coming by bus or who is coming by bike or in the future maybe e-bikes if that's possible um the current scheme one um has a bit fewer parking spaces than what's there now do you want to answer this one yeah how many parking spaces are there now versus shown on the plans? 
Okay. You should answer that one. Uh, we are approximately, we're showing approximately 170 parking spaces on each of these options right now. Um, that number might flex depending on um, the, the refinement of the design. Um, I don't have the number, but I can look it up really quick with what they have currently. Um, but I, we can come give you that exact yeah. number. Um, we'll look it up. Um, um, yeah, I was curious on a softball field. Um, what are the plans for improvement? I believe that the softball field will be turfed. It will have some fencing and some lights. And we'll also make sure that the outfield is a regulation outfield, which right now it's a little bit, it's not quite there. Necessarily have an opinion on this. I was just curious why both teams had the entry rate courses. The question is why do both schemes show an entryway closer to Vermont than Capitol Highway? Um, and I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, you know, we we heard very loud and clear um, about a preference for um, uh, an entry closer to Capitol Highway. And we really took a hard look at that. And one of the things that was really challenging is the fact that the entrance into this site is not a public right of way. It's actually a private road with an access easement. And it's very constrained and we can't do anything about it. And if we put the entry all the way up there and had that be the main entry for everyone to come, um, we would have some really significant traffic impacts. Um, and also we would lose some grandfathered in clauses for buses coming on Vermont. And so what we've been trying to do is make sure that it's a secondary um, entrance and that it can be uh, uh, as that they both can work together. Um, yeah. All right. Just, yeah, the main school. And, and then, uh, sorry, let me add to that. It was uh, very difficult to, uh, we want the main door to be proximate to parking for those who do have mobility issues. And it's uh, very difficult to get parking um, uh, to the west, the southwest side. And that's why you see parking almost exclusively on the southeast side, and then trying to find doors that can bridge between those two. I just wondered because I, my You know, operationally, there may be able to be a secondary entrance um, during certain times of the day. But school policy is really to keep it to one entry for security reasons. And so you'll notice that um, while there might be a commons door and there certainly are a lot of exits that could go to the north, um, we're not talking about them being entries that we depend on. The school could certainly um, allow for there to be um, a, a staff presence, but we're not depending on it. All the way back. Um, it's just a little more constrained. What is the difference between the current loading options? So the question is about loading options. Um, the, the I noted that between scheme one and scheme two, scheme one is a little more constrained. And the question is, how does scheme one compare with current loading? The loading will be better than your current loading, regardless of which scheme we move forward with. But, but I will say that one of the kind of constraints with Team One is that it isn't directly connected to a parking lot, um, which has its uh, pros and its cons. But it just makes it its own uh, sort of isolated um, loading access situation, whereas currently loading is connected to a parking lot. Um, so that's one of the main differences. Go ahead. Oh, no, there'll be a grandstand. Yeah, the question is about the grandstands for scheme two, and we didn't point out that there is a grandstand for scheme two. It's just 
kind of integrated into the hill that slopes down. Mm -hmm. um, and in scheme one, we're also still assessing the existing grandstands um, for whether or not the existing grandstands can be improved um, seismically or whether or not they will need to be replaced. All right. Oh, one more question, and then let's get to post-it noting and reflecting. Respect to the schemes, um, this one is built the track on the south to get to the south end of there. Is there an impediment to building the building in that location? The question is about, uh, if I understand it, whether or not there's an impediment to building the building kind of in this location where we have the track. And um, we had a previous scheme that had a building in that approximate location. And one of the strong pieces of feedback we heard was a real concern about having a building looming over Riki Elementary School like that and having you know high school students all uh, that close to the elementary school students. So we've been trying to make sure there's a bit of a buffer. That no site issue. Topography. The topography is really challenging to build a building there. I wouldn't say it'd be impossible, um, but we didn't study it any further um, because of those challenges. And the views, um, I think the views. And Oh, thank you. We also noted that if we built the building on that lowest portion, that it would actually impede views from any of the other fields to the west, uh, to those coastal range. And we, we really were trying to make sure that we could um, have, have some of those views be really prominent um, and, and some of the beauty that's there now could be part of that. We did have a couple of schemes though that did look at that. All right, um, Amelie has some parking numbers for you and then let's... Uh... Okay, so currently on the IW Wells campus, there are... <laughs> 249 spaces. That does not include the Riki, the, the street that essentially goes between Riki and Ida B. Wells or any of that. Part. So just on this campus, there are 249 spaces. Both of these show 170. That number could go up, could go down, depending on your feedback. Um, but one thing to note about the 249 spaces that are on this campus currently is that they do not meet code. Um, so if we were to do a renovation project of this school and update all of the parking, we would lose parking spaces because you have to have planting in parking lots, you have to have a, um, a, a certain type of uh, minimum slope at parking spaces, and there's all sorts of issues with that currently, as you know. So that number would inevitably be reduced if we were to upgrade the parking. It's just to keep that in the back here. I think we're going to move on to the feedback exercise. Please. Um, Talk amongst yourself, write things down on post-it notes and post things up on the boards and um, we're all around for specific questions.